afternoon as we come together to this special baptismal service for Gavin. We are really delighted to be together in God's house and we want to thank uh, the friends here at Blesden Baptist Church for the use of the facilities this afternoon. Chapel. Yeah. Where did I say? Yes, sir. That's a good start. <laughs>
and Father, as we have gathered, oh Lord, as a fellowship of your people, oh Lord, we thank you that we can proclaim that knowing Jesus indeed is the greatest thing. Oh Lord, knowing Christ as our Lord and as our Saviour, our Redeemer, Lord, we just thank you that we can gather publicly to, to, pro to profess and to proclaim the, the wonderful news that indeed Jesus is our Saviour. We have a wonderful hope in him. And Lord, as we gather in this baptism service, so Lord, we pray for Gavin. We pray for him, Lord, as he makes his public declaration that he indeed belongs to you, that he trusts in you, Lord, for the forgiveness of his sins, Lord, and, and the hope of eternal life. And Lord, we pray for him and his family, Lord, as they, as they um, continue to be a witness for you, as they, as they proclaim their faith in you day by day, as they as they shine, oh Lord, their lights, oh Lord, in this dark world, oh Lord, we pray for them, that they indeed, oh Lord, will be guided by your light, oh Lord, as they continue to serve you, Lord, using their skills, oh Lord, we pray for their work and the faith mission too, oh Lord, we pray for them, that you indeed would go before them, that you would use them mightily. Father, we just thank you that we stand united in Christ, Lord, and as we rejoice with one another, Lord, as we share the, the same hope. Oh Lord in Christ. Father, we pray for this, um, this, this service. We pray for all the praise that we give to you, for you indeed are worthy of praise. Oh Lord, as we read your word and as we study it, we pray that you would indeed open our hearts, Lord, and our ears and our minds to hear what you have to say to us, that we be challenged afresh by your word, that we be uplifted, built up, Lord, and challenged. Help us to serve one another, Lord, reflecting your wondrous love for us, Lord, that we would be seeing the needs of others, Lord, and that we would be, be meeting those needs, Lord, that we would be, Lord, listening to your prompting in our lives, Lord, that we indeed would be, be helping others, Lord, as we share your love. Oh, Lord, we pray for this community. Oh, Lord, we know that, oh, Lord, there's so many brokenness, Lord, so many people lost. We pray that they would find, oh, Lord, the, the joy in having Christ as their Saviour. Oh, Lord, we pray for all our efforts, Lord, in the UF, Lord, and the Baptist Church, in all our efforts to share your love, we pray that we would see men and women and boys and girls come to a saving faith in Christ. Oh Lord, we pray for a wider world, Lord, as we see the brokenness in it, we see wars, Lord, we see famines. Lord, we pray that you'd be meeting their needs, Lord, that they would find, O oh Lord, um, help in you. Oh Lord, we lift all these things before you now. Oh Lord, asking these things in Jesus' name, asking for forgiveness for our sins, for your mercy indeed is great. have testimony to the goodness of God and uh, we're looking forward to handing over to Gavin at this stage to tell us about his walk with the Lord and how he's come to know him. So we did other things. Anyway, we were at camp, and every year we would go back and forwards 
um, to camp in the summer. So in August of 2005, um, at the age of 10, um, camp started, I think it was 8, um, so I've been going, I was allowed to go for two years. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I was there in August 2005, I was 10 years old, and I'd been at camp, like I said before, um, but there's, there's games happening at camp, there's um, different outings happening at camps, um, meetings, one in the morning, one in the evening. Um, but one of the things that always happened at camp was we would learn a memory verse, um, and we would have a Bible story, but um, uh, the memory verse um, was one of the things that stood out to me uh, this year, uh, in 2005. Um, I'd learned memory verses the years before, I'd learned memory verses all my life, but this verse, um, there was a, a Bible college student um, called uh, Susan, she was a student from Korea, um, and she was there, and she was teaching this Bible verse, and the verse that I read this, this afternoon, as the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all, I think she called it as all unrighteousness, um, so all sin. Uh, and she was teaching that, that Bible verse, and she, she asked me to help her, and help me to pull some things off, off the board. But I, I didn't really think much about that through the rest of the week at camp. Um, but I, I don't even know what she said, I don't even know how she explained it. Um, but I, do, I did know that I needed to get right with God, I needed to... Um, get right with God, and the only way that I could do that was through Jesus, um, his son. And at, at that time at camp, I didn't think anything more about it. Um, I, I went home, uh, tried to kind of forget about it, and just went on with life, as you do at 10 year old, 10 year old stage in life. Um, but I, I, I couldn't get over this, this kind of thought that Jesus died, he died for me, he died on the cross, and his blood was shed for me, so that my sins could be forgiven. It wasn't anything that I could do, but it was because of Jesus, because he died so that I could be forgiven. One night I was in bed, that doesn't, testimonies aren't all about flashing lights and big sirens and everything. One night I was in bed, and I just remembered crying out to God and giving my heart over to him. So, uh, life, as it does, goes on. I started reading a little devotional, um, you know, a little kids' notes, and um, tops, or some of those kinds of things. Um, just a little thought for each day, started reading those, um, started to, to try to learn a little bit more about God and who, who Jesus was and, and the difference that, that this event had taken place, uh, the difference that, that would make uh, in my life. And as I went through life, um, as you leave primary school, as you go into high school, um, doubts come in, different things come in and you think, do, do I really believe in Jesus? Has Jesus really saved me? And then I read on as a, under this um, verse 10, uh, verse 7, sorry, as you read on down to verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive all unrighteousness, or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I was sure that Christ had come into my life, that Christ had saved me, he had rescued me from the, the grip of the evil one, from, from the, the, the road that I was on, heading to destruction. Yes, even a 10-year-old boy, um, even from birth, we're heading from to destruction. And unless we make a decision, like I did here, we are on that path to destruction. And I, I think it's a testimony is a, a challenge in itself. But I want to challenge anybody listening, anybody online, do you know God? Do you know where you stand with God tonight or this afternoon? It says uh, in Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I, I grew up, I went through um, high school. I went and I studied um, music for a couple of years um, in, in, in Northern Ireland. And I, I felt the call of God to Bible college. Oh, I don't know how many years ago that was. Um, I was too young to go to Bible college when I, I felt that maybe God was calling me to Bible college. But I went to... I went to a um, Bible convention that we have in, in Northern Ireland um, every Easter, and I went and I was involved in, in, the, in running convention, doing sound and different things. Um, and the Monday of the, the mission, or the Monday of the convention, as I was listening to the message, all that kept coming time and time again was um, Luke chapter 2, um, verse 49, and it says, I must be about my father's business. And I really felt that God was speaking to me and saying, we have to seek first God's kingdom, put Jesus first. In all that we do, in whatever way we, we go through life, we are to put Jesus first. So after that service was, um, uh, sorry, yeah, put God first in everything that 
that we do in, in our lives and put God first in, in my life and all that I do. So after that service, I, I, um, I didn't do anything about that, that call or anything about uh, what I felt, thought. Uh, the guy that was uh, leading the convention, uh, Kerry Matthews, he, he came up to me afterwards and says, have you ever thought of going to Edinburgh Convention? I said, no. He says, uh, they're looking for some help um, over at Edinburgh Convention. Will you go and help them? So, all right, okay. So I went over to convention in Edinburgh, um, and I was there, I was helping again with the sound and different things. Um, but again, I heard God's call on my life. Actually, at the, the graduation service at the Bible College, um, one of the, our workers um, down in England, um, she came up to me with the, I still have it, um, a little, what is it? It's not a fire, it's the, no, not a fire. <laughs> Again? <laughs> the, the little order service, there we go. You got there, yeah. uh, <laughs> The order service, she came up um, afterwards and she had written on the front, as she was um, going through the, the graduation, she had written on the front and she said, what year are you coming in? So again, God was saying, well, this, this seems to be um, like the thing. So um, that, was, that was a big part in, um, in, 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 in me going to Bible College. So we studied in Bible College. It's hard to believe that that was nine years ago, um, or thereabouts. Um, so we, we went in, we went through Bible College, and we studied in Bible College, um, and uh, we, we, yeah, we, we went, went through Bible College. Um, and, after, after Bible College, we came out and we were um, down in England for a year, just short of a year, um, before Isaac was born, and then moved back to Glasgow and we've been working here um, with the Faith Mission um, since, since then. Um, but as a testimony is, it's all proclaiming God's faithfulness, and it's all about God's goodness, it's all about God's um, just intervention and, and, and just working in our lives. And I suppose that's that's my, that's my testimony in a nutshell. There's other things I could share, but I just want to share this last thing, that, that God is number one. It doesn't, doesn't matter whether you recognize it or not. God is number one. He is the one who is on his throne. And I suppose I, I kind of picked a song, and I, I don't know whether they're singing or not. I hope they are. And behold our God. And he is seated on his throne above the circle of the earth. Um, and God is on his throne, and he is interested in our lives. And whether you follow God or whether you don't, Take time to think about him. Ask God to show himself. And he will He will show himself. And he will show himself faithful time and time and time again. So that's a little insight. Yeah. Thank you, Gavin, for sharing that with us this afternoon. As he says, it could go on and on and on because um, God's faithfulness to us is day by day, uh, not just as a 10 year old and as a teenager and in your 20s. It's right throughout the course of life, as many of us are able to, to testify to that. But we give thanks to the Lord for what he has done in Gavin's life, and it's a joy and a privilege to listen to that being recounted. We are going to sing the song that uh, Gavin has chosen, but not just yet, because he's chosen a psalm to sing as well. And we're going to sing this psalm first, and uh, it's Psalm 40, verses 1 to 5, and the tune is Matradon. <laughs>
like there are more things to talk about that we can number and we can say. Well, we're going to turn to that chapter that um, Gavin quoted in 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to have the verses 1 to 10 read to us by Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. on some of the verses in uh, 1 John. 1 John is not a very long chapter. It covers three pages in my Bible. Um, uh, four, actually. <laughs> Let's be honest. Uh, four pages. And if you have a letter, you want to read it right through. So um, I want you to think about this over the coming days as to why John was writing this letter. If you have a letter, you read it right through to the end because you want to find out everything about it. Well, we don't have time to go through the whole letter, but I want to just introduce the letter to you and find out why was John writing this letter, why is it so important, uh, and why should we actually read this letter through. Remember the stories when we were growing up as children, once upon a time? And it would take you to another world, not the real world around you, but it would take you somewhere where you could dream and fantasize about things that weren't anything like the normal, but it would just take you away for that little moment and you'd be in this dream world. Sadly, many people live their life as if it's a dream and they haven't woken up to the reality. And the reality is there is a God to be loved and there is a Savior to follow. And for many people, they're living in this fantasy world and John wants us to come to know a Savior. He wants us to come to trust the Lord for ourselves. Because one day the reality is we're going to wake up and we're going to find that there was a Savior. But for some, it's going to be too late. The opportunity will have passed, and they won't know him as a savior, but they will meet him as their judge, and they will have to face the consequences of not following or not taking uh, stock of all that has been said about him. But people are looking for reality. People want something to put their hopes and their dreams upon. And it's been going on since the beginning of time. People have looked for satisfaction, and they've looked for something to make sense in life. And some of them, they've looked for it in wealth, or in thrills, or in success, or in power, or in learning. And the list goes on and on and on. And some have even turned to all sorts of religions, hoping that they can make sense of this life that they live. Now, there's nothing wrong with looking for satisfaction, except that when you follow something that never will satisfy, well, it's not going to bring about the one thing that you are looking for. Wanting something real and finding something are two different things. And so what John wants us to realize is 
that he has something to offer and it's real. It's real. It's not just a wish list. It's not looking for something that you can't find. But he has found something that's real and he wants others to come to know the reality that he has found in trust in Jesus. Have you ever wanted candy floss? It looks lovely. You bite into it, you finish it, and you're still hungry. It's there, you chase after it, but it doesn't satisfy you. Better to buy a pie than a candy floss, because at least after the pie you feel you're full. Whereas a candy floss, you, you've taken it, it looks attractive, it tastes sweet, but you're still hungry. Many people are looking for something that's real and satisfying in life, but they bite them into a candy floss and it won't fill them. John wants us to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, to taste and see that he is good. And not only is he good, but he satisfies as well. And that's what John is trying to get across in this letter, which is why it's so good to read. Empty substitutes for reality will leave us unsatisfied. But Jesus always satisfies. And this is where John's first letter comes in. Written centuries ago, it deals with that theme that's ever up to date. What satisfies us? What is real in life that can satisfy us? And John has discovered for himself firsthand that the satisfaction in life doesn't come from thrills, but in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son. And he tells us about this living reality in just the first four verses of his first chapter of 1 John. And he tells us three vital things. First of all, this life is revealed. It's not a secret. God has revealed where we can find this satisfaction. One of John's favorite words is manifest, to be made known. And he tells us that Jesus, God's Son, who satisfies, has been made known to us. God has revealed him to us. This life was not hidden so that we have to go searching for it. It was revealed openly. The Lord Jesus came to proclaim the good news of God the Father and how he loves us. God has revealed himself to us, telling us and giving us an understanding of where we can find this satisfaction and the life that he wants us to enjoy. How has God done that? First of all, we're told in Romans 1 that God revealed himself in creation. But creation alone could not tell us the full story of God's love. Many of us enjoy a lovely sunset, or like looking up to the mountains, or, or looking out to the sea, and we see creation all around us, and it tells us something of a creator God who has, has so much imagination, and when we, we look at the sky, uh, one of our daughters is a scenic artist, and we look at the sky and they say, oh, isn't the sky lovely? She said, yeah, I can see about nine different colors there. <laughs> I can see blue and pink. <laughs> but she sees all the different shades. God is creative. In, in the sense in which he, he, he has made all things beautiful. He has revealed himself in creation, but it doesn't tell the whole story. There's so much more about God that we, we need to know than just enjoy a lovely sunset or a sunrise or a, a lovely view from the mountains. God has also revealed himself more fully in his word, the Bible. He has opened to us the scriptures, given to us the scriptures that we can understand how he thinks and what he thinks and, and how he longs for us to get to know him. And so through his word that he has given to us, revealed himself in his word for us. But God's final and most complete revelation is in his son, Jesus Christ. Listen to what John says in uh, his gospel. God's final and most complete revelation is, he says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. If you want to know anything about God, look to the Lord Jesus Christ, because you see in him his Father. And 1 John 1, uh, no, sorry, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. So the greatest way the Lord God has made himself known, revealed himself, manifested himself to us is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we are looking for satisfaction, we will find it in the Lord Jesus Christ, who God has given to us 
to show us the way to live a life in all its fullness. Because Jesus is God's revelation, he has a very special name, the Word of Life. And we find that title given to Jesus in 1 John chapter 1, the Word of Life. And we see it again in the opening of his Gospel. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The same title, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Why does Jesus have this name, the Word? Because Jesus is to us what our words are to one another. We use words to one another in order to be able to express what we think and how we feel. And Jesus has come as the living Word to express to us what God thinks and feels towards us. And we find that He longs for us to come to know Him and to find salvation through His Son, Jesus. He's the living means of communication of God to men. To know Jesus is to know God. John tells us that Jesus is the Son of the Father, the Son of God. And he warns us several times in this letter not to listen to the false teachers who will tell us lies about who Jesus is and what he came to do. We're to listen to the words of Jesus himself. Those who deny that Jesus is the Christ is a liar, he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. And in 1 John chapter 4, he goes on to say, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So John warns us that are those who speak the truth about Jesus and are those who try to deceive us concerning the Lord Jesus. But Jesus is God. He is the Son of God, God's gift to reveal to us the truth about God. You see, if we're wrong about who Jesus is, then we're wrong about God. Because Jesus is the final and complete revelation to us of who God is. And so when we read about the life of Jesus, and we see the wonderful kind of life God wants us to enjoy, we will see that it's not just by imitating Jesus as our example that we share this life, there's a far better way. It's experiencing Jesus in our own life, trusting him personally and knowing him and calling him our Lord. And so first of all, this life is revealed, but secondly, this life is experienced. God hasn't just shown us, but he allows us to experience that. Sometimes we look at something that's happening around us and we think, oh, that looks fun, that looks exciting. But we don't really know how much fun or excitement you have until you try it yourself. God says, don't just listen to what I say. Put your trust, experience it for yourself. Put into practice the things that I tell you. And experience this life for yourself. Don't just listen to the others who say, this is a great thing. Know it for yourself. And so in verse 2 of 1 John 1, he tells us the life was made manifest, we have seen it and testify to it. We've made it our own experience. We've trusted what God has said for ourselves. John knew Jesus face to face. He and the other apostles heard Jesus speak. They watched him as he lived amongst them. They knew that Jesus was real. He wasn't just a vision. He was God in human form. He became man and dwelt among us. He lived and walked alongside them on earth. He knew Jesus personally. And so the challenge is, do we think that we were born 20 centuries too late? It was okay for John. He saw him. How can we make him our experience in this generation? It wasn't just the physical nearness. It was the spiritual reality of all that Jesus spoke made sense and fulfilled the satisfaction that was longing in each one of their hearts. And God can fulfill that longing that we have to be known and to know the truth for ourselves. These are, uh, followers of Jesus had committed themselves to their Saviour and their Lord. Jesus was real and exciting to John, and he wanted others to know the reality for themselves too. So he writes this letter. By trusting Jesus, they had experienced eternal life. And six times in the letter, John refers to the need to be born of God. We become one of his children. We are belonging in his family. Not just an idea that John had invented. He heard Jesus say himself, 
In John chapter 3, verse 3, I say to you truly, unless one is born, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless we are born of God, unless we become one of his family, then we cannot see his kingdom. This is a real life experience for us to become part of God's family. Only after we have believed the gospel and put our trust in the Lord, we know what being born of him really is. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, says 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Eternal life isn't something then that we earn by our good deeds, not something that we deserve because we've lived a good life. Eternal life is a real gift from God to those who trust Jesus as their Saviour. And so John writes his gospel to tell us how to receive this wonderful life. And then he writes his first letter to tell people how to be sure that they've been really born of God. The gospel tells us how we can receive this life, and his letter tells us how we can be sure that we've been born of God. How we can put our head on the pillow knowing that no matter what, we belong to him. There was a college student who returned to university after going home to his grandmother's funeral. And once he got back to university, his lecturer noticed that his grades were dropping. And he thought after the time he'd settled down and he'd refocus and his grades would improve. But it was the opposite. He got worse and worse. And in the end, the, the student uh, told his lecturer just what was happening. When he was home, he turned to the family Bible that belonged to his grandmother and he found out that he had been adopted for the first time. He, he hadn't been told. And he was already in university. And he said to his lecturer, I don't know who I belong to, and I don't know where I came from. And that troubled him. And his whole focus and his whole life had been turned upside down. John wants us to know, with assurance, who we belong to. We belong to the Father who loves us, who has revealed himself to us, and allows us to know from our own experience that we belong to him. We come from him and we are returning to him. The assurance that we're in God's family, that we've been born of God, is vital and important to each of us, to know that for certainty. And John says we can know it, and that's why he's writing this letter, that we can be sure that we belong to him. There are certain characteristics that he highlights about God's children, certain things about us, that will confirm that we belong to him. A person who is born of God, in chapter 2, verse 29, lives a righteous life. No one no longer wants to follow the ways of the world, but wants to live a life that pleases God. Doesn't want to satisfy themselves, but wants to live to please God in all that they do. A child of God, he says in chapter 3, verse 9, doesn't practice sin. Seeks to avoid sin. Doesn't want to partake in that any longer. But he also qualifies that in chapter 1, verse 8, telling us that occasionally we will commit sin, we will fall. But we're not making it a habit. None of us live that perfect life that we long to live. But that doesn't rule out that we can't experience this life and we can't know God. Because he says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. None of us have got to that point. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us. He will go on forgiving us for those times when we slip up. God's children, he tells us in chapter 4, verse 7, love each other and love their Heavenly Father in chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 1. Characteristic of one who knows for certain that they belong to God, will love other family members and love the Father too. They no longer love the things of this world around them because the world hates them. But they instead overcome the world with the strength that God gives to them to hold fast to his teachings and to live a life of obedience. These things mark out then the true family of God. Why is it important that we know that we've been born of God? John tells us, if you're not a child of God, then you're a child of wrath, a child of the devil. And so it's important that we know that we belong to him, not to the enemy. The child of the devil is a counterfeit Christian. One who acts as though they are saved, but has not been born again. Jesus called the very religious Pharisees children of the devil. 
Outwardly, they lived a life that looked good, that people admired, that people respected. But at the end of the day, he says that they were counterfeit. They were children of the evil one, not children of God. And counterfeit Christians are still common today. Something like a counterfeit note. Suppose you have a note that's been made not legally but illegally. You might think it's genuine and you might spend it. You might pay for petrol with it. And the petrol station take the money and they use the money and buy more fuel. And the supplier takes the money and he pays his grocery bill. And the grocer takes the money to the bank and puts it on the counter and the bank teller says, that's not a real note. He's done certain good things for certain people on the route, but it was counterfeit. It didn't actually justify being used and it's taken out of circulation. Now there are some people who seem to live a good life, but at the end of the day, they're counterfeit. They're not true followers of Jesus. They might have impact and an involvement and a usefulness in certain places, but at the end of the day, they're not real. John wants us to have the reality of knowing the truth and allowing the truth to set us free and live in a life that doesn't end in disappointment and being told you didn't cut it, but you're the real thing. You're a child of God and that's for eternity, not just for this life. Many people will do good things in life, but on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do mighty things in your name, and I will say to you, away from me, I never knew you. We don't want to be in that situation. John didn't want his followers or people around at the time to, to be in that situation. He wanted them to know for certainty. That's why he's written this letter. That's why it's important that we read it for ourselves too. This life is revealed, this life is experienced, this life is shared. What we have seen and what we have heard, we proclaim also to you. So when we become a follower of Jesus, we want to tell others, and that's what Gavin's been saying this afternoon, telling others about the fact that God is special to him, that the Lord Jesus is his saviour, that he has known the joy of having his sins forgiven, peace with God and the hope of heaven to come. This life is not just revealed to us, this life is not just experienced by us, but this life is to be shared so others come to know the joy of trusting Jesus too. John gives reasons as to why, why we should follow Jesus and live according to his ways tells us that it gives us fellowship with the Father. It brings us back into a relationship with God that we need. Inside of us is a desire to know God. People will look to satisfy, satisfy that desire in many ways, but the only real way is to find satisfaction in knowing God the Father through Jesus. He tells us that, in, uh, that we are to um, experience this and it's good for us to do so because we have joy, lasting joy. The emptiness in life is replaced with the joy that comes from knowing God. He tells us that this is important for us because it's, it, it prevents us from sin, it keeps us from sin. It focuses us on living a life that pleases God, not ourselves or anyone else. Faith in Jesus gives us a joy that can't be du duplicated by the world. This uh, joy that comes keeps us living a life to please God and to avoid the things that disappoint him. He tells us it's important that we understand this, this reality of this relationship with God so that we're not deceived. God gives us his spirit to guide us and to direct us and to keep us from falling and to be uh, misled and, and misguided upon life's walk. And then finally he says that we might know we are saved. It's important that we know the reality of who Jesus is because that is the only way that we will know the reality of being saved by him, not just for now, but for eternity. John is saying, I want you to be sure that you too have eternal life 
There's no middle ground. We either know it or we don't know it. It's as black and white. Do we have the reality that John wants us to have? That Jesus is God's manifestation of how we can have satisfaction, not only for this life, but for all of eternity too. May God bless his word to us this afternoon and may encourage us to go home and sometime this week to read that letter through. See, there's a letter written to you by John to help you to trust the Lord Jesus Christ because you couldn't do anything better than that. Well, we're going to sing that hymn that Gavin has asked us to sing. He's been sitting there in anticipation of doing this. So let's do that now as we sing. Who has held the oceans in his hand? Who has numbered every grain of sand?
commemorate and to do in memory of our Saviour and in serving and following Him. One is the communion, the Lord's table, where we are told to come and to remember. And through the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup, we remember the body that was broken and sacrificed for us and the blood that was shed to forgive us and cleanse us of our sins. It speaks about the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus. And also in baptism, it also speaks of the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ as we go down into the water and we are lifted, uh, thinking of the Saviour who, who died and was buried and on the third day was risen to life. Water symbolising the washing away of sins and the coming up to eternal life as Gavin comes up out of the water. We are reminded that he is saved for all time, for eternity. Not just for the years that we have on this life, but for all time. There is no parting for us as Christians. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we look forward to enjoying eternity with those who have gone before and with those who follow. Isn't that wonderful? This life that we have is just temporal. Just for a few moments. Like the grass that grows and then withers away, so our life is here and gone. But that's not the end, says the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is an eternity to be lived for. And this symbol of baptism reminds us of the everlasting life that we've been given as we die to sin and are made alive in Christ Jesus because our sins have been cleansed and washed. Not because we were good enough or deserved it, but because Jesus has done it for us. And so in obedience to the Lord's command to be baptized, Gavin comes to follow that command and we rejoice with him as he takes this step. So Gavin come to the front this afternoon. It was after his resurrection, but before he ascended to the right hand of our Father in heaven, Jesus gave these words of command. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so the sacrament of baptism established by Jesus is a sign and a seal that displays and declares a number of things about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our forgiveness of sins by washing, not by water, which is the symbol that we use this afternoon, but by his blood, which is the real gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he shed his blood for us. It also speaks of the new life that we have by his Holy Spirit. It speaks of our adoption into his family, that we might know that we belong to him. And it speaks also, as he looks forward to the resurrection, to eternal life. And on the day of Pentecost, Proclaiming to the people, Peter says of the Lord Jesus, on behalf of the Lord Jesus, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Gavin, you come this afternoon in response to the call of the Lord Jesus, through the hearing of the gospel and the leading of this Holy Spirit, to make public profession of the Christian faith and in going through the waters of baptism. You do so with the assurance of Jesus' words. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. So if you confess him here, he will confess you before his Father. Let us then as a family of God's people hear that you profess the Christian faith, that you intend in dependence on the help of God to live as a member of his body and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. So, Gavin, you come of your own choosing to acknowledge the covenant of grace, to profess your faith publicly in the Lord Jesus, and to receive strength from the Holy Spirit. So, do you reject sin, confess your need of God's forgiving grace, and pledge yourself to glorify God and to love your neighbour? Will the congregation please stand? It's always good to remind ourselves of what we believe as God's people, and we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed together, let's say, of what we believe in and through the revelation of the Lord Jesus to us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let me just pray for Gavin before I put some more questions to him. Father, we want to thank you for Gavin. We thank you for his life and his testimony to the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ in his own experience and walk with you. We thank you that you have saved him for all time, for all eternity. And we thank you for the love that you have placed upon him and the love that he has for you and for your people. We pray your blessing upon him now. As he makes these promises before you and confesses his faith and love for the Lord Jesus Christ, may you be to him all that he needs, not only to make these promises, but to keep them for the course of his days. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Gavin, do you confess your faith in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, taking the Father to be your Father, the Son to be your Saviour and Lord, and the Spirit to be your helper and guide? Do you promise to join regularly with your fellow believers in worship of the Lord, to be faithful in reading the Bible and in prayer, and to give a fitting proportion of your time, of your gifts, of your finances for the church's work in the world today? And do you promise, depending on the grace of God, to, provide, uh, to profess publicly your love for the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve him loyally in your day-to-day -day work, and to walk his ways all the days of your life? I'm glad you said that because you needed to say that before we go into the program. <laughs> now as we take our shoes and socks off, we're going to uh, sing together. Um... No, we're not. <laughs> we've just sang this the hymn. So, um, perhaps you can play the words of the chorus that we're going to sing when um, Gavin comes up out of the water. This is a chorus that Gavin has taught me yesterday. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's an old chorus and I can't believe my wife has known it for 33 years we've been married and she's never played it for me. So she's going to play that and we can look at the words and then when Gavin comes up out of the water we will sing this uh, together. And then Robin is going to come and take over the remainder of the service work we're going to change. Uh, but um, we'll uh, get ready to go into the, the pool and... Uh, can listen to the music being played so we can sing this song together.
Gavin, you've confessed your love for the Lord Jesus. You've confessed your belief in him as your Saviour and, and, and your Lord. And now we baptise you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, praying that the Lord Almighty will bless you through his love throughout the course of your life. <laughs> It was a long time ago, and over the years we, we have had much fellowship 
uh, we have many missions together and joint prayer meetings and it's tremendous that we're one in the Lord and we can do that together. But as we close our service uh, this afternoon, and I've held the mic from the Lord to the, the hymn, when I fear my faithful faith, will fear he will hold me fast. So let's rise to sing this hymn.